Um, by way of introduction, uh, you've already met these three great people, uh, but in case anybody's new to the room, uh, The Wolf, can you introduce yourself and we'll move down? Sure. Jason Rosenberg, everyone calls me Wolf. Uh, I own a company called American Eye Gaming Solutions, and we uh, work with tribes and regulatory bodies and operations and also vendors to uh, get them into new gaming technology, whether it's eye gaming, sports, skill games, esports, whatever it is. Yeah. Valerie? Good day to you all. Uh, my name is Valerie Spicer. I'm the Chief Gaming Officer for Vetnos. Uh, we just recently launched a Class 2 sports-themed app uh, in Chicken Ranch Casino in Northern California. Very exciting stuff. So a lot going on, uh, just pushing the edge of technology. And Robert. Yes, I'm supposed to be on this one. So, yeah. uh, <laughs> uh, My name is Robert Christensen, uh, Director of Interactive at Choctaw Casinos and Resorts. Um, helped joined the nation three years ago, helped launch Social Casino, and now we're working to build a Class 2 mobile on-prem product uh, for real money and using that same tech stack for sports betting when that becomes available. And uh, I'm Jonathan Petamaridis, and I feel very honored and pri privileged to be here um, on the tribal track as a European. Um, so thank you for the invitation. Um, I've worked internationally um, across land-based and online gaming, uh, and I spent a period of time working um, in Native American country about eight, nine years ago. Um, but some of the innovation we were pushing then um, included the first live dealer studio in North America before uh, New Jersey regulated. And um, it was all a little bit premature. So we're here today to talk about mobile on-premise, which is an emerging uh, area. Um, I put my tail between my legs, went away to um, get some omni-channel operating experience uh, and now bring that back into investments uh, in this space that benefit, uh, benefit the tribes. So um, we've all got perspectives to share, but uh, Valerie, why don't we start by just defining for the audience, because there are people from Europe here who might not understand what class two gaming is. So can we start with that? Sure, absolutely. Um, class 2 as a term is a term that comes from the Indian Gaming Regulatory Act. Uh, there's Class 1, Class 2, and Class 3. Class 2 is uh, games of chance that are not banked games, and at the core of it all is a bingo-driven game, bingo technology, bingo platform. Uh, that's pretty straightforward. Um, but why is Class 2 gaming so significant to the tribes? Um, well, Class 2 is solely, as I said, it came from uh, IGRA. It is solely operated by tribes. Uh, it is not something that a uh, commercial gaming operator operates. Class 2 is operated by tribes. Within the states that, they are, that they're at, they're not required to have state regulatory oversight on Class 2, as well as they're not required to do revenue sharing on class two. Very important. Uh, so it is, to me, if I, if I were to say, it's, it's like the fallback plan for tribes. It's, the, it's, it's where they started, it's the present, and it's the future. To me, it's almost like the Alamo that you go back to if you need to. Um, but it is very, very important to tribes overall. So am I right in thinking that any profit from class two gaming goes back to tribal benefit, is that correct? Absolutely, there's no revenue share on class two, and depending on the tribe and how they're structured, you know, obviously the, the whole idea for uh, tribal gaming, as was mentioned before, was to strengthen tribal gov governments, to help promote self-reliance, and to help drive economic diversification. So when you're able to retain the revenues that you make as a result of Class II gaming, that helps every one of those elements of IGRA. So, Robert, you're in uh, the Choctaw Nation of Oklahoma. Um, just give the audience a sense of your floor split. Um, how many games would be Class II compared to Class III? Um, I don't know the exact percentage, but the large majority is Class II games across the board, and it's... Um, 
been that way from the beginning. Class, like Valerie said, Class Two gaming really is one of the greatest weapons that tribes have in protecting sovereignty. And so, where there's an opportunity to grow Class Two, it's our position to grow that as much as possible. Yeah, that's wonderful. I think I think most people are aware that Oklahoma is a big Class Two driven market, and there's pockets in California. But where else in uh, the U.S. are we seeing? Class two growth because there is a renaissance uh, and investment by the big manufacturers in this space. So, can you give me some idea about other parts of the country that are growing class two? Jason, do you want to? Uh, sure. I was just gonna, yeah. California and Oklahoma have the most slot machines. Uh, I live in Las Vegas, and everyone likes to think that's the capital of it, but it's not. Um, besides those, it really depends on the state because it depends on the, the compacts that tribes have, right? So, for example, uh, Wisconsin and Michigan, uh, Wisconsin doesn't have uh, a class three cap. Uh, most of the tribes don't. Um, Michigan, it's so high that they don't really have to worry about it and they can run as many class three machines as they want without uh, having to pay additional taxes. But anywhere that, I mean, sorry, the answer is really anywhere where you can run where you want to run class two games and keep all that revenue. So I know there's, uh, actually Chris Guerra was here earlier. We were talking about class two mobile on-premise in Kansas. And uh, that's, yeah, that's, that's a, another good one as well. But Valerie, can we, can we be specific on which states are sort of driving class two in, in this renaissance? Absolutely. So obviously Oklahoma, but, you know, the, the tribes in Texas, I mean, earlier uh, Oscar was here and represents Alabama, Cushada, you know, the tribes in Texas are class two only. Um, Porch Creek is also class two only. Um, there are some other, uh, er, like uh, the Miccosukee tribe in Florida is class two only. Um, there are tribes that have class two only facilities uh, in the country. So this is an opportunity to them. And then there's tribes that have a mix of class two, class three on their floors. And I think in a, in a number of cases, like for example, I live in Arizona, the tribes that are very r rural are going to have more class two uh, on their properties because of the revenue retention and the competition to the metro area that, that retains a lot of, you know, takes a lot of the revenue. So it, it allows them to not just not necessarily be competitive but but to retain revenues for their for their tribe that's sorry just real quick that's that's a good point like in uh in northern california i i do a lot in southern california with tribes but in northern california y you might have a tribe that has 15 machines in a gas station and they need all of it like it's it they don't have that option so yeah right i think the prior panel and i'm not sure if missy's still here but she teed this up quite nicely uh, to be a little bit more granular on innovation within mobile class two, and, and that's what we're tasked with discussing. Um, Valerie, if I can start with you, um, can you tell us a little bit more about Vetnos and, and the uh, launch at Chicken Ranch and, and the product itself? And we can go yeah, a little bit. Absolutely, I'm happy to. You know, it, it's been a it's been a journey. <laughs> it's been a journey. And, you know, I'm very fortunate to be involved with the folks from Vetnos. And as in addition to that, we have two tribal partners, okay. uh, the Chicken Ranch uh, uh, Miwok out of California are an investor and partner, as well as the Eastern Shawnee Tribe of Oklahoma. So they're both part of, you know, investors in the company and, you know, in its growth. Uh, we began working on this probably about three years ago. And, you know, you think bingo and you think, oh, how hard can that be? Well, it's harder than you think, you know, and especially when you want to take bingo, technology, mobile on-premise, and sports and merge them together. So it's been uh, quite the journey. You know, we're fortunate to have a very good development team, management structure who has been supportive, and take the time to do the work. Uh, we, ha we worked initially with a very strong law firm out who does a lot of work in Oklahoma on Class 2 who gave us the legal guidance and structure and uh, was able to get their legal opinion and then went on to uh, take our games to Eclipse Gaming, who's well-known for class working Class 2, who also did 
their review and their opinion on the game itself is class two, meaning t class two technical standards. So, you know, we were very uh, proud of that, you know, and, oh, and okay. then, you know, just started uh, this last month within uh, California uh, with a live target group at the Chicken Ranch Casino to launch with them and, and run it through its paces. You learn, obviously, a lot from that, and it's been a very good learning learning tool. Yeah, fantastic. I, I'm quite looking forward to uh, seeing it in a few weeks, so well done. Uh, Jason, what other class two mobile innovation are you seeing in the market? You, you, you said you work across the U.S. Yeah, um, I, obviously the class two mobile on-premise is a huge thing right now. It's uh, it's the thought around it has been here for a while, but it's actually starting to take shape. Uh, we're seeing more and more vendors get involved because that was kind of the real issue: um, is how do, how do we do this? Who's going to supply it? Because the, the iGaming platforms have been around, and you can geofence that. It was okay, uh, who has Class 2 games ready to go online? And so that was kind of the big challenge that we were facing last year. Um, more and more of the suppliers have taken a look at this and thought, you know what, we really can do this. Um, so, so they're pushing uh, when, I'm not going to name names, but when a major slot manufacturer makes a game, they're also making a Class 2 version of it. They're also making an online Class 3 version of it and an online Class 2 version as well. So uh, I think we're going to see a lot more of the content, actually, which is which was the big missing component. So, yeah, we should start seeing uh, quite a few mobile on-premise properties showing up. Fantastic. And, Robert, you're in the sort of early stages of developing your solution. Are you, are you able to share much about that here? Yeah. Yeah, so um, over the last two years, really, uh, we have been working with several different content providers to address the concern that, that you mentioned where... Um, you know, lots of companies have RGS set up. Lots of companies have Class 3 in brick and mortar and Class 2 in brick and mortar, but nobody had really made a, a, a mobile Class 2 RGS. And so we've spent the last two years getting out, spreading the word that this is coming. Uh, we've established our platform, and um, our, our tribal goal is to have a platform that can house any interactive gaming solution that we want to have in the future. So for us... Ag uh, being agnostic is super important. So we've established that, and now working with content providers to bring the dream to life. And uh, our goal is to go live by the end of this year. Uh, we're we're confident we'll we'll reach that. So yeah, that's wonderful. I think absolutely key is that these projects are customer driven and not vendor driven. Um, I th you know, I went to WinStar recently to have a look at the customer journey for the latest uh, class two launch there. And it was off the main casino floor and not easy to access. And I think we really have to grow this ecosystem together and, and uh, collaborate. So the agnostic approach is music to my ears because ultimately you've got to give the customer choice and what content they want to play. Um, from operating experience, I know that when you're launching strategic initiatives like that into venues you need to really uh, plan across the board. So can you tell us how you're managing that process and how you approach sort of embedding strategic initiatives into uh, operator side? Yeah, so we, we spoke about this in the last panel, but uh, <laughs> um, it's important to involve key stakeholders from every area of the business early on. So, um, and staying focused on strategic initiatives really keeps not only us focused, but keeps other people involved and, and more open-minded and uh, more willing to see the value of what we're trying to do. Um, the other part is you can plan for every unknown, <laughs> but no amount of planning will ever stop that flow of unknown problems. And so um, keeping everyone involved early will help you identify more than you would otherwise. Yeah, that's wise. I think... Um one of the other panel panels I sat in this morning spoke about, it might have been you, uh, Wolf, when you, you talked about um, colleagues not understanding um, new launches, new products that have been launched, and uh, operators are essentially only as strong as the weakest link, right? So if, if your valet isn't aware or if your dealer's not aware that you've got this fantastic investment um, hidden in a VIP area off the floor, there really needs to be colleague engagement plans put in place uh, 
before uh, to make that work. So let, let's just talk about the benefit of class two um, to all stakeholders. So it's an emerging area, mobile on premise, but it's only in a handful of locations as far as I'm aware um, across the US at the moment. So what, what's the benefit to the operator? What's the benefit to the vendor? And how do we collectively grow this emerging uh, area for tribal benefit? Robert, I, I'm going to start with you. Actually, yeah, go ahead. Um, I mean, it, it's been spoken to quite a bit already, but um, we as tribal operators, first and foremost, we serve the nations that we, we work for and we're a part of. And so um, it's absolutely critical to expand the class two footprint. And that, that's really the narrative that we've been, we've been helping our different areas understand is by adding this extra piece, we're not, we're not cannibalizing what's on the floor, yeah. but we're seeking to increase the opportunity to grow net revenue for the, the people of the Choctaw Nation of Oklahoma. So it's incremental revenue. If I'm playing devil's advocate as the moderator, if I've got 10,000 slot machines in, across 1.2 miles in some of these big casinos in your state, why do I need a mobile solution with some games on it as well? I'm just throwing it out there. I'd, yeah. love, I'd yeah. love to take Jason, it. please. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, um, the answer is uh, whenever I uh, am asked that question by an actual operator, uh, I ask them if we can go to the security command center and let's count how many people are sitting playing slot machines while they're also playing slot machines on their phone simultaneously. Let's count them. And because there's the fear of, oh, well, we don't want to do this because it's going to cannibalize the actual floor, right? And it's not. It's, it's going to enhance it. Uh, but that I, you can actually see people when you're looking, look at, whether they're eating or whether they're at their pool or whatever, somebody's playing something on their phone. It's, it's really interesting. In a previous life, we actually tracked the IP of what online, in a regulated market, what online sites people were playing within a casino. And we, it, it shocked us. It was literally Bet365, PokerStars, bang, 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 all the way through whilst they were sat at the table playing. So if you're an operator well worth doing a bit of a study just to, uh, to track that and, and you'll be amazed because essentially this is a share of wallet argument and you want to be one of the wallets. You want to be, you know, most customers will play three to five apps at any one time. They're not loyal in the online world as they are to your venue. If you can be one of those five apps, you're doing well. Um, in my opinion. So, yeah, Jason? I was just going to say, like, if it's like you just said, it's all part of the revenue. Like, you, you're operating brick and mortar slots, and do you want this money that someone's doing it to go somewhere offshore, or do you want that money? Is really. Absolutely. Yeah. Valerie, sorry. Sorry, one other thing. You can earn. It's sorry. Well, if you're a player, you can. If I can earn points while I'm Absolutely. playing a slot machine and doing this, and I, I, I'm way more loyal to the property. So. Absolutely right. Sorry, I'll be quiet. <laughs> no, you won't. I know you won't. <laughs> so I, I think, and then the perspective that we took, too, is that, you know, and, and this is not to knock slots in your, on your phone, but you had to have other content, and that was the direction that we took. Mm -hmm. You know, you have to have something else other than another slot on this device. Uh, and it, I was interesting, for me, I, I think it was at SBC last year, and uh, Sal from uh, Agua Caliente was sitting next to me. He said, I want everything that's on this floor or anything that can be done in a casino on this phone. Yep. And I said, well, then that would be more than slot machines. And I would challenge that you need more content. And the direction that we went in was, you know, the sports direction because it's so proliferated right now and so exciting and everybody's, you know, doing it. But we had to have, we wanted to fulfill, one, the need, and two, an opportunity. And to take and add a layer of content that was something different than just another slot machine. And then the other thing that I would say for the people that are doing the slots on their phones is that, you know, depending on the property, you know, if someone's queued up and busy on, on any given night and someone's favorite machine isn't available, it could be right here in their hand, right? So Completely I've seen different. that as well, too. Yeah, wonderful. So those are the drivers as well as the tax benefits and the um, education programs and good causes back to the, the tribal nations. There's actually a customer need. You're giving customer choice and uh, it's very encouraging. Last few minutes here as we wrap up. Um, 
there are people from all around the iGaming world here, um, and there's lots of lots of talk around tribes and trying to understand more, especially around Class 2 mo mobile on-premise. Do you guys have any advice to those people um, thinking of entering the space? Maybe they're providing content. Um, just go down the line. So, Jason, we'll start with you. Um, I, would, I would say content and content differentiation. Um, I, I, my advice is if you're a platform provider, don't bother. Uh, there's already a lot of pre-existing relationships uh, with tribes, and, and they've been working on this for a long time. It really comes down to uh, if you're able to put your content in the class two, and if you're able to differentiate it um, uh, besides DFS or slots, I, I've seen um, uh, really like digital scratch games, which can be done predetermined outcome. And if the tribes are able to do uh, pull tabs, mm -hmm. it's a digital version of that, and it, it, that's class two as well. So I think that we'll see some of that. But yeah, I'd say okay. content differentiation and additional. Get, get into the content game. It's a good takeaway. Valerie, any thoughts? Yeah, you know, I agree. Content actually is king. People, you hear that all the time. Content is king. It is. But I would also say to um, get some education on what is it that the tribes are looking to do in strategic direction. Don't come to them with what you feel is their answer. Mm -hmm. Ask them what they need so that you can work collaboratively with them rather than to tell them what they need. It, that just really makes them mad. <laughs> you know? uh, I think that's wise, and I'm sure you'd echo those thoughts. Yeah, Val Valerie, that's absolutely correct. A every tribal nation is different. Yeah. Every strategic initiative is different. So understanding that um, there's a ton of differentiation between each of these partners that you'll talk with. Um, but on top of that, too, you have decades of operations experience in these buildings across the country. And so... Um, Recognizing that these are professionals as well is uh, super critical. Um, and then on the content side, I know many of you guys have harassed you over the last several years, <laughs> the importance for Class 2 games online. Um, so just to be the evangelist once more here on this stage, um, we're at the beginning of this revolution. There's going to be more opportunities over the next five years than we've ever seen in the iGaming space in North America because of mobile on-premise Class 2. So please, as we grow this, be open-minded, and um, yeah, I look forward to continuing to bug all of you. So, Final watch out yeah. from, from my <laughs> side. Um, I've seen European content providers coming to the U.S. and be quite naive around the patent landscape. Um, so I'd say just have an have a eye on the patents, the regulatory needs of meeting the regulatory needs in Indian country and going about it through the right partners. Uh, we've invested in some conversion technology that takes that class three to class two. Um, and uh, that's a bit of a unique uh, solution. So all of these guys are easy to find on LinkedIn, and I've probably got the longest name in the industry. So um, please connect and uh, look forward to meeting you. Thank you. Robert's going to be on every panel from now on. Now. I'm just going to stay here. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Appreciate it very much.